It was the longest war in U.S. history, spanning an era that saw the Alamo, the Mexican-American War, and the Civil War come and go. It was the 60 years of ongoing battles, fights, and raids that took place between the Great Plains nomadic horse warriors and settlers, traders, and the United States military. With as many as 20,000 casualties on each side, it made the wild, wild west a dangerous and violent place. It is simply called the Indian Wars. People have occupied the Americas for perhaps as long as 40,000 years. Over these years, they have created great civilizations, equaling any found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. In North America, Paleo-Indians hunted the mammoths and mastodons. They were replaced by archaic Indians, who lived from 5,000 to 1,000 BC. They left behind remarkable cave art. In at least one instance, they hunted bison, the species known as the American buffalo, by driving them into kill sites on the eastern Colorado plains. But these hunter-gatherers were moving towards becoming agricultural societies. Prior to the arrival of Europeans in 1492, the transition to agrarian cultures had been nearly completed. Indian nations extended across North America. A network of cities flourished as a part of a mound-building culture in the East. In the Southwest, the Anasazi and their contemporary cultures built equally remarkable dwellings. Then in the historical blink of an eye, they all disappeared and were replaced by the configuration of tribes in place at the start of the 17th century. Many of which then vanished as a result of European diseases and settlement. During this time, the great cities were replaced by small agricultural villages. Then as the Europeans expanded across the continent, the surviving tribes were pushed ever westward into a constantly redefined and shrinking Indian territory. However, during the middle of the 18th century, two parallel events occurred on the North American continent. The creation of a new type of nation, the United States of America, and the creation of a new kind of Indian culture, the warrior horse culture two remarkable human transformations that would eventually clash in bitter conflict. Two large mammal species played an equally critical role in creating the remarkable Plains Indians culture. One was the horse, an animal brought to the New World by the Europeans. The other, a member of the cattle family, was the American buffalo, indigenous to the continent. The American buffalo can trace its ancestry back to the Pleistocene era, when its relatives roamed among the mastodons, mammoths, giant wolves, and lions. In fact, the buffalo is the lone survivor from that ancient time. A herd animal, the buffalo is covered with long, dark, brown, woolly hair. It has a massive head, high humped shoulders, and a tufted tail. Fully grown, buffaloes are five to six feet high at the shoulders and can weigh as much as a ton. Like other members of the cattle family, 
they thrive on grasses. Prior to the 1800s, it is estimated that the buffalo population ranged somewhere between 60 to 80 million. They were found wherever prairie grasses grew, from Canada to Texas, and from the Rockies to Ohio and Kentucky. It was said that when one of the vast herds moved through an area, it kicked up a cloud of dust darkening the sky. For 10,000 years, buffalo had been hunted on foot by the Native American tribes, but were never the principal source of food and material for the Indian, as the deer or elk were. That changed with the arrival of the Europeans and their horses. The horse was particularly important to the Spanish in their conquests and explorations. The Spanish Iberian Mustang was not a huge grain-fed animal like the horses from Northwestern Europe and the British Isles. It was a desert-bred animal that could live entirely off grasses and go for long periods without water. It was capable of carrying a man in heavy armor over miles of burning desert and dry high plains. In 1680, there was a massive uprising by the Pueblo Indians against their Spanish overlords. When the surviving Spanish fled, they left behind their sheep, cattle, and horses. The Pueblo, a sedentary people having little use for the thousands of Spanish horses, simply let them roam free. These horses, thriving on the short grass prairies, formed the nucleus of the great Mustang herds of the Southwest and Southern Plains. This great horse dispersal produced, perhaps, the most rapid cultural transformation hitherto ever witnessed on the planet. Within 100 years, a number of Native American tribes on both sides of the Great Plains had transformed themselves into nomadic, buffalo-hunting horse cultures. Horse cultures with names like the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Arapaho. One hundred years after the Great Horse Dispersal started, most of the remaining North American tribes had horses. But only a few tried the grand economic experiment of developing a true nomadic horse culture. At the same time, the short grass prairie offered a huge unoccupied region for expansion. While unfit for permanent settlement, it was ideal for any group that moved easily with the wanderings of the millions of buffalo. The horse provided the vehicle and the buffalo provided a virtually inexhaustible supply of high-quality protein, giving the tribes willing to venture onto the plains the chance for rapid population growth. Each of these tribes has a unique story of its transformation into a horse culture. The why has long been lost, but the journey has been recorded. Looking at the Great Plains as a sea of prairie grass, all the eventual nomadic tribes started in the north, three from the eastern shore and four from the western shore. Unlike the other horse cultures, the Navajo and Apache moved into their 18th and 19th century homelands prior to the arrival of the Europeans in the 16th century. They were part of a very large subarctic group generally referred to as the Athabascan speaking Indians. Their ancestral home covered a large part of Canada's Northwest Territory. Anthropological records 
indicate these people lived in small family groups, were nomadic, and hunted caribou. Sometime between 900 and 1400 AD, a group identified as the Southern Athabascans migrated south into present-day West Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. When the Spanish arrived in 1540, they were already split into two distinct groups, the Apache and the Navajo. Each had their own territories and customs. And because of their close proximity to the Spanish, they were the first to tame horses. In fact, in 1659, the Navajo were the first Indians to attack Europeans using horses. At the same time, their Apache relatives used the horse for food and as a beast of burden. The Navajo were more settled than the Apache. Like most tribes who had names for themselves, such as the True Ones, Only Ones, Real People, and Human Beings, the Navajo referred to themselves as Diné, meaning the people. They lived in permanent dwellings known as Hogans. These eight-sided buildings were perfect for the desert southwest, remaining hot in the winter and cool in the summer. Capturing horses, sheep, and goats from the Spanish, the Navajo established herds of their own. They became excellent weavers, and their rugs and blankets became highly valued trade goods. The most important person in the Navajo family was the woman, who owned the land, the home, and the livestock. All Navajo life centered around the family, including religious ceremonies. One of the most important was a healing ceremony known as the Night Way. In this ceremony, the Navajo used sand paintings like this one to heal the sick. Shamans, called singers, created these sacred pictures using crushed rock of many colors. While the Navajo practiced more settled activities like farming, the Apache preferred raiding and hunting. Indeed, the Apache moved seasonally with the antelope, elk, deer, and buffalo. Traveling in small groups or as individual families, they would set up a circular hut known as a wikiup. Each wikiup housed a family. From these camps, the Apache raided the Spanish or other tribes capturing sheep and goats, which they ate, and mustangs, which they used primarily as pack horses. The Apache, though they numbered less than 5,000, were among the most warlike of the Indians and had long-running feuds with almost every other tribe of the southern plains and desert southwest. They formed no religious institutions, but looked for spirituality in everyday life. The famous Chiricahua leader, Geronimo, who was also a healer, explained, We had no churches, no Sabbath day, no holidays, and yet we worshipped. Sometimes the whole tribe would assemble to sing and pray, sometimes in a smaller number, perhaps only two or three. Sometimes an aged person prayed for all of us. Unlike later arrivals to the plains, neither the Apache nor the Navajo formed any significant military alliances with other tribes. The Kiowa's journey onto the plains began somewhere in the Kootenay region of British Columbia, Canada. From there, they migrated into western Montana in the 1600s. Around 1700, 
They reached the Yellowstone River area. Ten years later, after acquiring the horse from the crow, they found a home in South Dakota's Black Hills. Very quickly, the Cheyenne and the Sioux drove them from this home. Again, they moved south, where they fought a bloody war with the Comanche. However, by the beginning of the 19th century, the Kiowa formed a strong military alliance with their former adversary. This alliance was at the center of the battle for the Southern Plains. Their language is believed to be part of the Aztec Tenoan linguistic stock. It is a language grouping spoken by many Mexican Indians. Like all the nomadic Indian nations, the twin centers of Kiowa life were hunting and war. Though small in numbers, the Kiowa were known for their exceptional bravery, strict military organization, and strong warrior societies. The Kiowa were also known for their incredible storytelling pictographs. Indeed, they came very close to developing a written language. Much history of the Indian Wars comes from their pictographic records written on buffalo hides as a kind of yearly calendar. Another nation, later called the Kiowa Apache, accompanied the Kiowa as they migrated south. Though unrelated genealogically to either the Kiowa or Apache, they had the cultural traits of the Kiowa and spoke an Athabascan-based language like the Apache, hence the Kiowa Apache designation. Their Uto Aztecan language places the Comanche as part of the Shoshone Nation that occupied a large part of the Great Basin area of Wyoming, Utah, and Nevada. Sometime in the 17th century, a small band of Shoshone from the mountainous region of Wyoming migrated south along the Rocky Mountains. Around 1700, they acquired horses, and by 1720, they were in present-day Kansas. By this time, they had become the finest horse breeders on the plains, owning the largest and richest herds of Indian ponies in the West. For the next 150 years, the Comanche would lord over the most expansive Native American empire the continent would ever see. Master horse warriors, the Comanche fought and defeated the Apache and the Spanish. It is said that the Comanche killed more whites than any other Indian tribe. Eventually, they formed military alliances with the Kiowa and the Southern Arapaho and the Southern Cheyenne. Although the Comanche controlled a large empire that stretched across the southern plains, they were less organized socially than their Kiowa allies, but organized in small bands of 100 or so warriors. The Comanche rivaled the Spanish conquistadors in wealth and power. Like the Spanish, they were also slave traders and profit seekers. Of all the Plains nations, the Comanche were the most open to new ideas. It was perhaps their greatest strength. According to historians Joseph Cash and Gerald Wolfe in their book The Comanche People, the Comanche, by bringing in captives from so many different groups, kept their nation vigorous and far-seeing. But while the Comanche were far-seeing, they also recognized the value of the old traditions, such as using spider webs to tell when a storm was approaching, thus enabling them to use the weather to their advantage during raids or hunting. A second group of Indians moved onto the plains 
Not from the northwest, as did the Apache, Navajo, Kiowa, and Comanche, but from the northeast. At one time, both the Cheyenne and Arapaho were part of a large village-dwelling group of Indian nations known as the Woodland Culture that lived in the upper Great Lakes region of the United States. The Cheyenne and Arapaho were both Algonquin-speaking people. The exact ancestral homeland of the Arapaho is unknown, but many believe they once lived along the banks of the Red River between the border of North Dakota and Minnesota. Sometime in the 1700s, the Arapaho arrived near the headwaters of the Missouri River. From the headwaters of the Missouri, the Arapaho pushed south towards the Black Hills. Though they made a military and economic alliance with the Cheyenne, they warred with the rest of the Plains tribes, including the Sioux, Pawnee, Comanche, and the Shoshone. In fact, it was by stealing their horses that the Arapaho became a full-fledged horse culture. The Arapaho practiced and perhaps originated the sun dance, an annual event the sun dance was a test of endurance for the participants, as they had to dance and perform rituals for days, often staring into the sun. While the Arapaho were fierce fighters, they were known more for their welcoming ways than their warlike nature. This characteristic stemmed from their form of government which used consensus to make decisions for the tribe. Usually consensus was reached among the adult men and some of the elderly women. Unlike the Comanche who did not allow women to have any authority at all, elderly Arapaho women held the authority on religious matters. When the child was born, the umbilical cord was placed in a special beaded case and attached to the child's cradle as an amulet. When the child learned to walk, he or she carried the amulet with them wherever they went. The first historical record of the Cheyenne was in 1680, when a group of Cheyenne encountered the French explorer La Salle in present-day Illinois. Shortly after this encounter, the Cheyenne moved westward, separating from their woodland neighbors. Still living in permanent villages, they farmed along the Missouri River in North and South Dakota during the mid-1700s. But at century's end, they had lost the corn as their legend told, and became a true nomadic horse culture. For a brief period, they occupied the Black Hills, only to be pushed out by the Sioux. Perhaps the most important Cheyenne ceremony was the Medicine Arrow Rite, also known as the Arrow Renewal Ceremony. At the end of spring, the Cheyenne arranged their teepees in a crescent with a great medicine lodge at its center. Then, for four days, the entire tribe concentrated on renewing the power of their weapons through four sacred arrows, which were thought to have supernatural power over men and buffalo. In the 1830s, some Cheyenne and Arapaho gravitated to the trading post at Bent's Fort on the Arkansas River, while others preferred to trade on the Missouri and Platte. The two groups eventually made an informal division. Eventually, the Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho would ally themselves with the Sioux in a battle for the Northern Plains, and the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho would align themselves with the Kiowa and the Comanche in the battle for the Southern Plains. It has been said 
that no tribe suffered more during the Indian Wars than the Cheyenne. Horse mounted, riding into battle against the cavalry, wearing long buffalo robes, smoking the peace pipe in a colorfully painted teepee. For most Americans today, these are the images of what the American Indian was like. These are actually images of only the Plains Indians, more than likely the Sioux. The Sioux, also known as the Lakota, the Dakota and the Nakota, were originally a woodland Indian tribe that dominated the southern two-thirds of Minnesota, as well as parts of Wisconsin, Iowa, and North and South Dakota. Unlike the neighboring Algonquin-speaking woodland Indians, the Sioux spoke their own language, Siouan. There were four ancestral branches of the Sioux. The Santee, which was made up of four distinct bands. The Yankton, with only one band. The Yankton I, formed from three bands. And the largest and best known branch of the Sioux, the Teton, also known as the Lakota. It included the Ogallala band, the Bruli, the Hongpapa, the Minikanju, and three lesser known bands. It was the Lakota branch that first gained the horse and spread west to the Black Hills and beyond. It was the Teton branch that became one of the most formidable combatants in the Indian Wars. And it was the Teton who had the greatest number of warriors on the plains and inflicted the greatest defeats on the United States cavalry. Aside from their warlike prowess, among the Plains nations the Sioux were known for their kindness, charity, and brotherhood. Each Plains nation had its own creation myth and its own sacred person or spirit who came to Earth and gave it the traditions necessary for a healthy life. According to Sioux legend, a white buffalo maiden came to them, bearing a pipe and instructions on how to live. The pipe represented the covenant between the Sioux and the buffalo. Like the Kiowa, the Sioux kept a pictographic record of their history known as the Winter Count. Drawn on buffalo skins, it recorded the momentous events of the year with a single picture. Three other tribes became expert horsemen living at the edges of the Great Plains. They were the Crow, the Blackfeet, and the Pawnee. While they participated in the Indian Wars, they never developed a true nomadic lifestyle. By the start of the sustained fighting that culminated in the final phase of the Indian Wars, the Plains Indian tribes had settled into stable territories. By this time, the seven tribes, while retaining a number of distinctive features such as language, shared many customs and ways derived from becoming nomadic, buffalo-hunting, horse-oriented cultures. There was no more dramatic sight on the plains than hundreds of teepees silhouetted against the setting sun. Life on the plains for the Indian nations that followed the buffalo required a living structure that was big enough to hold a family, was warm in the winter and cool in the summer, sturdy against the fierce prairie winds, and perhaps most importantly, the Plains Indians needed a structure that was readily transportable, easily assembled and disassembled. The teepee fit these needs perfectly. In the Sioux language, teepee meant dwelling. 
The Upper Great Lakes tribes had smaller versions of the teepees seen in historic photographs. Teepee size for those early Indians was restricted by the lack of carrying capacity of the domestic dogs that were used for transportation. That restriction was removed with the arrival of the horse. The materials for a teepee came from the buffalo and the lodge poles cut from pine woods. Gathering these materials, hunting the buffalo and cutting and trimming the lodge poles was done by the men. The rest of the work was done by the women. Not only did the women tan the hides and sew them together, they were also responsible for putting up the teepees. The basic design of the teepee was remarkably simple. Buffalo hides stretched over a framework of lodge poles. Erecting a teepee was simple as well. First, three poles formed the tripod base to which additional poles were added. When this was done, the cover, perhaps made up of as many as twenty buffalo hides, was lifted into place and secured at the top. The bottom edge was pegged to the ground, and the entrance flap was put in place with more wooden pegs. The last two poles were used to control the smoke flaps. The unexpected sight of even a lone warrior appearing at the horizon struck fear in the hearts of travelers and cavalry soldiers alike. The paintings on his horse and the number of feathers in his hair showed how powerful a fighter he was. Dressed in the colorful regalia of his tribe, wearing the war paint that indicated he was ready to die in battle, this single warrior might mean hundreds more lay hidden in ambush, or he might just want to trade. Like the teepee, whose shape was both practical and symbolic, so were the Indians' clothes. In summer, the breech clout and simple leggings were perfect for the desert-like heat of the plains. In winter, the heavy fur and tough hide of the buffalo kept him warm in even the most frigid conditions. The markings on his clothing indicated which tribe he was from and his prowess as a warrior. The animal skins used to make his garments showed which spirit guides he looked to for personal power. While a warrior took the utmost care with his appearance when on a raid, it was the women who made all the clothing for the family. The buffalo, the all-purpose beast of the plains, was the source of most clothing. Deer and antelope also provided skins for garments. As trade with the white man increased, factory-made cloth, blankets, and even boots were used by the plains Indians. Still, the buffalo remained the most important source of clothing right up to the end of the Indian Wars. The buffalo's tough hide was used to make robes, caps, moccasins, leggings, mittens, coats, and dresses. Women left the fur on for winter garments and removed it for summer clothes. While in camp, Men and women dressed simply for freedom of movement. However, on important ceremonial days, they dressed in their finest clothes with the tribe's distinctive quill and beadwork on display. In colder weather, the warrior wore leggings for warmth. He also wore leggings when hunting or on a raiding party to protect his legs. Leggings were colorful and profusely decorated with paint, bells, shells, quills, or beads. It was as a warrior in a raiding party that the men displayed their finest garments. Within each tribe, 
Distinctive decorations indicated specific warrior societies. However, individual warriors used paint to show their personal war honors. Ceremonial shirts, generally known as a war shirt, were extensively decorated and worn during raiding parties. These shirts hung loose and fell well below the waist. The northern tribes, such as the Sioux, had the most glorious war shirts. The Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Kiowa painted celestial symbols on their war shirts. Generally, the southern tribes were less adorned. An Indian's hair was deemed directly related to the soul and as such was treated as an adornment. While on a raid, it was often decorated with beads and colors to make it distinctive. Warriors who had counted coup in battle would wear eagle feathers as a mark of their bravery. The Sioux wore their hair loose as a sign of humility. Some southern and central plains tribes shaved their heads except for a short tuft. They often then painted the head as well as the face red. In the golden age of the plains Indians warrior culture, their costumes were among the finest ever made, showing distinctive beauty and personality. It was the well-ordered social structure of the seven Indian nations that enabled them to thrive in the harsh environment of the plains and desert and battled the U.S. military to a standstill for nearly 40 years. It was a social structure that was organized into groupings within groupings. At its base was the family. The next largest group was the extended family called a clan. After the clans came camps or villages. A camp could be made up of a single clan or a band which consisted of multiple clans. Sometimes these clans would be related by marriage and sometimes not. Villages in turn were spread out over a tribe's territory. Depending upon the time of year, the village could be as small as 20 or fewer people, or large enough to stretch along a river for 15 miles. Life in camp revolved around the teepee. Women did all of the tasks that made the household run. They collected firewood and cooked meals, gathered suitable roots and fruits, scraped buffalo and antelope hides, prepared buffalo meat for drying, and made all the clothing from moccasins to breeches. The women took care of the children until five or six years of age, often nursing them for the whole time. At that point, young boys went to help their fathers with the pony herds, and young girls followed their mothers, learning what it meant to be a good wife and mother. But while seemingly engaged in menial tasks, women were not considered servants. They had their role and scorned men's help. The man was the head of the household. His job was to hunt and fight, tasks that inevitably took their toll. So much so, that there were many more women than there were men in a typical clan. The result was, tribes practiced polygamy, and a man, if he survived the hunt and battle, could have several wives in order to maintain population numbers of a clan at a functional level. 
In fact, clans and bands operated with a great deal of independence, particularly when it came to interactions with other Indians and whites. Because Indian nations were spread out over a large area, it was important to have events that brought them together to solidify their tribal and band identity and to plan tribal and band activities such as warfare. These events took the form of ceremonies, feasts, and dances. For example, celebrations meant huge bonfires, drumming and dancing far into the night. During summer encampments, bonfires might go on for weeks at a time as the entire community gathered to witness feats of daring through the dance steps of the participants. The throbbing of the drum and the movement of the dances celebrated victories, hunts, marriages, planting seasons, and harvests. Indians had a song for every event, from odes to a warrior's horse, to a death song that he might sing during a battle. It was all part of their own unique religion. To the Plains Indians, everything in the world served a purpose in their lives. The sun, the mountains, the animals, the rivers, the trees. Everything in a warrior's natural environment had a connection to the Creator and therefore was filled with its own mysterious force. God or the Creator or the Great Spirit was not separate from the earth. This meant everything was sacred. The many rituals and ceremonies of the tribe connected its members to the earth and everything in it, as well as to the creator of all things. As a result, the Plains Indians believed that they could, through ritual, directly connect and participate with God of the spirit world. The most important ritual for every warrior was the vision quest. The quest lasted from two to four days and included fasting, staying awake, and crying for help from the spirits. That drum is is uh, is the centerpiece of the whole powwow. It's like uh, it's like uh, the earth. The earth is round, and everything in that in that circle it touches. When you go in, like like we are like now, you go in. You come in into this, but when it closes up, you can't see here or anything. So what's going to happen? You're going to, once somebody tells you, you're in your mother's womb. And you have no clothes, you're naked. So when you go out, when this opens up, you don't run out. You're going to crawl out, I guarantee you. Because of what happened in here. So when you crawl out, you crawl out like when you were a baby. See? So when the, you take the water and spit it on yourself, it, it, you take everything and put it back in it, so you start anew. Vision quests were used by warriors to provide them with a direct link to the spiritual world and to aid them in finding supernatural protection. The dance and the beating of the drum were, and still are, of great importance to the Plains Indians. By 1840, 
economic and social transformation of the Plains Indians from agricultural and sedentary societies to nomadic warrior hunters was complete. The military alliances among the tribes and their territories would not change over the next 50 year span on the plains. This period was called the Indian Wars. Ironically, at a time when much of the Western world was experiencing the Industrial Revolution, the Plains Indian horse culture had completed a grand experiment in producing a true warrior society. One that would nobly fight for its land and way of life.